Hello everyone! Stan here, long time no see. Welcome to the newest channel in the family of our encyclopedias, covering the hobby spot of our tank love. Now Wolf is taking care of the modeling part, and an excellent job he is doing, and I thought I'd take a moment and share some things about the tank books I have been recently reading. And the latest one I finished is Red Army Auxiliary Armored Vehicles 1930-1945 by Alex Tarasov. Now, Alex is a team member of Tank Encyclopedia and the editor of the Tank Encyclopedia magazine, so this is a bit of us blowing our own horn, but bear with me and I promise I'll be fully honest with you. Now, the title is pretty self-explanatory and based on the fact that this is a book from the Images of War series, I didn't have the hugest expectations. Like, I guess that there would be some really nice pictures and a bit of text covering the development of some obscure everyone ignores them support vehicles and that would be it. And honestly, I was half right. The second half of the book consists of a series of photos covering auxiliary vehicles developed by the Soviets both before the war and during the war. Now, most of them are coming straight from the Russian archives and they're in excellent resolution and you will not see them anywhere else. They cover some fascinating stuff, including the operation of bridge layers, the firing of flamethrowers, and some stuff that is unrightfully forgotten. And honestly, if that was it, if the whole book was just these photos, it would have been well worth the about $20 it costs, not including shipping. But the text, oh boy, <laughs> the text in the first half of the book knocked it out of the ballpark. Instead of just succinctly describing the vehicles seen in the photos in the second part, Mr. Tarasov forgoes that entirely and goes directly into the development of the Deep Battle Doctrine, how it appeared, what it entailed, how the Soviets failed to implement it, how it died with its creators in the Great Purge, and how it was deemed heretical. The interwar Soviet concept of battle involved the use of mechanized and armored units carrying long-distance operations against the enemy, for which they absolutely needed all types of auxiliary vehicles, such as armored personnel carriers, armored recovery vehicles, armored ambulances, bridge layers, tractors, trucks, and a whole lot others. And the Soviets launched into this with a plomb, designing a large pallet of auxiliary vehicles to prototype stage, testing them, and then... and then nothing. Due to industrial problems and the Great Purge, all of these went exactly nowhere, and what followed was a veritable doctrinal borscht. With the exception of some flamethrower tanks, the Soviets went into World War II with no APCs, no ARVs, no all-wheel drive trucks, no engineering vehicles, and generally very, very few auxiliary vehicles. Sure, they built an absolute ton of tanks, but these did not perform to expectation because of the lack of other stuff that was supposed to support, repair, recover, supply, command, and assist them and the units they were part of. And in this way, history actually redeemed Tukhachevsky, the guy behind the battle, as his ideas were validated in the fires of war and implemented into the Red Army, partly during the war and almost completely after it. Now, Alex Tarasov also does a very good job of presenting reports from during the war about how this complete dearth of auxiliary vehicles hampered and handicapped the Soviets in their operations against the Germans and Japanese, covering operations from 1942 to the invasion of Manchuria in 1945. These illustrate very well the serious problems the Red Army faced and which go a long way to explaining a good chunk of the dynamics of the Eastern Front and how the Germans managed to fare so well, despite often a large paper battle equipment superiority on the Soviet side. There are a couple of examples Mr. Tarasov gives where the Soviets were forced, due to the mud and poor roads, to use their tanks to cover all of the other auxiliary roles they didn't have the vehicles for and how that basically ate the engine and transmission hours into the ground, with obvious reliability and availability consequences. 
Another very important thing that this book illustrates is the importance of Lend Lease for the Red Army. While Lend Lease may not have been the most important in terms of tanks and fighters, it was absolutely critical on the auxiliary vehicle front. Not only did American trucks motorize many units of the Red Army, being well superior to their Soviet counterparts in quality and popularity, but at some point, the vital Soviet reconnaissance units were almost completely equipped with lend -lease equipment, such as Valentine tanks, American half-tracks, and British carriers. The only problem I have with the first part of the book covering all of this is that it is too short. Just 62 pages left me wanting far more, but it went a long way to making me understand the situation of the Red Army and the dynamics of the Eastern Front during World War II. And I kinda understand that this is the format of the Image of Wars series. Still, I honestly hope Mr. Tarasov will come back to this topic in another format and continue the amazing work he started in this. Oh yeah, another problem I have is with the title of the book. Like, I understand it perfectly describes the topic of the book, but it is so drab that it undersells the book by way so much it is infuriating. Would I purge the man responsible for the title? No, probably not. Would I break his little pinky? Probably would. Now, would I recommend this book? Yes, and very much so. If you have even a faint interest in the Eastern Front and the Red Army, get this and read it. And then read it again, which I plan to do as well shortly. If you're a real tank lover, definitely get it. Either parts are definitely worth their money and together they're a sweet, sweet deal. Not only that, but Pen and Sword have it at half off on Amazon right now, although I have no idea for how long. There's a link in the description, so check it out. And that's it from me for now. Hope you enjoyed this and I'll see you next time with the Romanian Revolution. Don't forget to check out Wolf's Jagdpanzer 38 build and our historical videos over on our main channel. Until next time, keep us in your sights.